Today's amazing series starts in the far future, and humans have spread out through the galaxy, and we start our story at planet Terminus. We see kids running to a mysterious vault that has a force field which pushes anybody off. But one of the kids wanted to break the record of the furthest anybody has gotten, and he starts to get pretty close to it. But before he can reach it, the force field blurs his vision and knocks him out. He is then saved by Salver, a woman that is thought not to be affected by the vault. As we're introduced to her character, she tells us to understand the future we should learn the past, and we are taken to 35 years earlier. In that timeline, we meet a young woman named Gail Dornick. She's from a planet called Synax, and we meet her as she was getting ready to leave the planet to the Empire capital planet Tranter. And she's going there because she won a math competition made by the greatest mathematician, Hari Selden. We see Hari and his adopted son Reich talking about her arrival in the Empire Library. There's also another reason Gale wanted to leave Synax. Synax is a very religious planet that's banned and purged all scientists there, and Gale thought herself mad to save her planet from the rising sea level, but this has turned everybody against her. After saying goodbye to her parents, she's transported to a jump ship, and she meets a man named Gerald. And this Gerald guy gives her information about the travel and Tranter, and she reaches the planet Starbridge, a massive transport system that goes from the surface of the planet to outside of space. And once she finally reaches the surface, she meets Reich, who takes her to Hari. He asks her a few questions about her work to make sure she actually solved the problem, then reveals to her that they will all be arrested by the Empire the next day. Gale is confused and asks why, and Hari explains that it's because of his theory called psychohistory. It's some kind of mathematical model which is able to predict large population actions, effectively predicting the future. He tells her that the Empire doesn't like his prediction, as his model shows that Trancher is going to be destroyed and the Empire will fall. He shows her the Prime Radiant, which is a visual representation of his equation, and she realizes that the Empire believes she's the only one that can prove Hari wrong. And of course the Empire thinks this because she's the only one that solved his math equation. And Hari agrees that this is what the Empire thinks, but he's sure that he is right. But Gale felt very upset because she was lied to and she goes to her room. Next we're introduced to the Empires named Dawn, Day and Dusk, who are all clones of Emperor Cleon I. They've been called in three stages of life from a young boy to an old man, and this genetic empire has been ruling the galaxy for centuries. And because of Hari's prediction, they feel afraid because their empire is supposed to crumble. They also believe that the prediction will start unrest and rebellion throughout the galaxy, and they plan to squash Hari and his followers and send their armies to bring them to court. And the next morning, Hari and Gale are brought to court in the charge of high treason. Hari argues his case, telling the empire that they will fall within five centuries. He claims that the collapse is not stoppable and that the Dark Age will last 30,000 years after that. He then tells them that he can shorten the Dark Age to only a thousand years if they let him build the Foundation, a collection of all human knowledge and history that will be protected from the collapse and humanity can use this knowledge to start back up again and will be able to rise in just a thousand years. The Empire though is not convinced, and that night, the Starbridge is attacked by bombers and it leads to the death of a hundred million people. Gale was told by the Empire to discredit Hari's claims and she was even pressured into lying but she actually ends up backing up his theory. Then we see Day asking Hari if there's a way to prolong their empire, and Hari tells them to stop the cloning and give new people power. Day does not listen to this advice, but he does grant them to work in exile in planet Terminus. Terminus is an outer reach planet 50,000 light years away, and they'll be able to build a foundation there, and as the episode ends, it cuts back to the present, to Salver saying that nobody could approach the vault except for someone different like her. She then says that she always wondered if Hari knew that the galaxy's fate would rest on her hand as he was formulating the plan. And on episode 2, the episode starts with the Empire soldiers led by General Demirzal attacking biohack facilities to find out where the bombers got their bomb. They've been unsuccessful on finding out who planned the attack, but they found the people were from the planets Anacreon and Thepsis. Both of them deny involvement in the attack since they hate each other so much and are unable to work together. Back on the ship, we see that Gale and Reich have started to have a relationship, and we also learn that they have four years left to reach Terminus. The Foundation team has been training in a simulated environment to be ready for the harsh planet. Hari, as usual, has been working on his math, trying to create the best outcome. 
Gail has also been studying the math and believes that Hari's model is not perfect. She tells Reich about her finding, and he asks her if Hari's model can be totally wrong, but she tells him that the model is most likely right, but there are so many moving pieces that could change some parts of the outcome. We then go back to Tranter, and Dusk goes out to the damaged city to see for himself and talk to a seer. He asks the seer if Gale is also a seer and if she can see the future, but he is told the opposite and he's also told that their empire is doomed to fail. Dusk wanted more answers, but Demirzol urges him to leave, as rubble and debris was still falling from the sky. In the Empire's castle, Dawn watches Demirzol as she fixes herself and is revealed to us that she's a robot. Dawn says that her kind are all dead, but she corrects him that they were destroyed by his kind, and she tells him that as long as she acts human, she can become one too. On the other side, Day and Dusk were arguing about what to do with the other planets, and Dusk believes that they should show mercy, but Day believes in showing strength, and they ask Dawn for his opinion, and he tells them that he is scared and he hugs Day. Tension between Dusk and Day are growing, as Day thinks Dusk is getting too old, and Dusk sees Day as a person who's committing the same mistakes when he was younger. We then go back to the ship, and Gale was attending a Foundation meeting on Hari's place, as he was visiting people in the lower levels of the ship. Later, everyone meets for lunch, and Hari starts telling the story about Reich's birth parents, which really upsets him so he gets up and leaves the table. Gale then follows to comfort him, and they sit in a simulated beach and talk about what they will do when they finally get to Terminus. And in Tranter, Day has finally decided on what to do with the planets in Nacreon and Thepsis, and he gives a public speech about the attack and the need for retribution, and he ends up hanging the diplomats of those planets, leaving only two, and at the same time he decides to attack the two planets, and he shows the people, and we see massive ships shooting at the planets, killing millions as retribution, and the citizens of Trantor cheer as the other planets are slaughtered. Dusk watches from their castle disappointed, and Day freezes the two surviving diplomats and tells them to tell their people that they couldn't save them. After the execution, Dawn asks Demirzel how many times they've done this, and she responds by saying that they've always done this. Back in the ship, Gale is feeling uneasy and she runs to Hari's room, and she finds Reich stabbing Hari and killing him. A very surprised Gale tries to save Hari, but Wright drags her and takes her to an escape pod, and he gives her his knife, and just before he releases her, he tells her that he's sorry and that he loves her. And as the episode ends, we see Gale in her pod, traveling through space. And as episode 3 starts, we see that it's 400 years earlier, where we're introduced to Cleon the first as he's watching the star bridge being built. Standing next to him is Demirzil, and Cleon tells her that he doesn't know what will happen once he dies, since he has no children to take the throne. He also regrets not being able to see the star bridge being finished, and Demirzil assures him that his legacy will continue on, revealing to us the clone program was started by her. We also know that she must have led the Empire for a period of time, when Cleon died and Dawn was just a child. We are then taken to 19 years after the Starbridge bombing. We also notice that Dusk has become too old and is awaiting his death, which they call Ascension. He meets up with the others and they take him to the top of the star bridge for the last time, and they promise him that they will build it better to remember his legacy, and as they leave, they destroy the remaining of the star bridge. And when the final hour came, Dusk came to be known as Darkness, as he is now aged and was ready for ascension. The new dawn has been born, and he hugs the new dawn and also says his final goodbyes, but as he walks to the ascension machine, he feels that something is wrong. But Demirzel holds his hand and leads him to the machine, which incinerates his body, turning him to dust. Seventeen years later, we see teenage Dawn removing Darkness's paintings from the wall. We also see that the colonists, the Foundation group, arriving at planet Terminus, but as they land on the supposed barren planet, they find the mysterious vault. At first they try to approach it, but the vault's force field pushes them and makes them fall unconscious. And after that, everybody pretty much ignored it and settled around it, and in a brief scene we see a young Salver being fascinated by the vault. We learn one day that she approached it, and the vault wouldn't attack her, and her parents hide this from the others, but she still became an outcast. We are then taken to the present time where the first episode started, and Salver, after saving the kid, goes on to check on the vault, and finds out that the field is expanding. Later that day, her traitor boyfriend Hugo arrives at Terminus for a break, and we see some of their romance and their dynamic, and after they, um, uh, get acquainted with one another, Salva wakes up late at night and she says that something is bothering her, and she goes to monitor the perimeter. But as she gets there, she sees a young boy running into the colonist ships, and she runs after him, but she only finds this wild creature that she had to scare away by firing her weapon. As she looks up after she fired, she notices Anacreon ships approaching the planet. 
She gave this information to the other colonists, but they were not concerned as they were protected by the Empire. But unfortunately, when they try to contact the Empire, connection fails, and they figure the ships will land in 40 hours, and Salvor prepares for the worst by collecting all the weapons at their disposal. The next night, Salvor wakes up with the same feeling, and she goes out again to see the same kid running into the ship. This time, we see the kid is holding a knife that Raich used to kill Hari with. And just like yesterday, Salva runs after the kid, but again finds the creature, and this time, it's been shot with an arrow. As she takes out the arrow, Anacreon warriors surround her, and the episode ends as she turns to them and asks why they're there. We then move on to episode 4, and this episode opens with teenage Dawn jumping off a balcony. And a young gardener named Azura witnesses his fall as his protective device stops him from dying. And we also notice that this Dawn is somehow different from any of the others, which is a problem since all Cleon clones are supposed to be identical. And Azura noticing him, she just runs away feeling scared, but he was really interested in her and he starts finding out more information about her. On the other side of the palace, Demirzal informs Day that the Proxima Opal, a very powerful religious leader with trillions of followers, has died. This presents a problem for the empires, as the new person to take over wants to change the religion practice to before the empire was started. The empires fear that the new leader could deem them unhuman, as they are clones and according to the previous practice, only people should be able to lead the empire. Hearing all of this, Dusk plans to visit the new possible leader and fix the situation. We notice that even though it's been 36 years since the Starbridge bombing, unrest has continued throughout Triton and the galaxy. The Empire has also learned that the communication system with Terminus has stopped working, and this really worries Day, as he fears that Hari's prediction might be coming true. Teenage Dawn doesn't know anything about Hari, so they show him a holograph of his prediction during the trial. Later we see Dusk was getting ready to meet up with the new leader, but Day stops him and says that he will go instead. Demirzel interjects, saying that Days don't leave Triton, and Day then says that Dusk's previous action as Day are causing all of this to happen, and he reminds him of the day where he chose violence against Anacreons instead of mercy, and then says that he won't repeat the same mistakes. Back in Terminus, we pick up where we left off, and Salvor is surrounded by the Anacreon, and she asks them why they were there. The leader tells her that they are scrappers and they're looking for the old ship module, and Salver is then forced to lead them there, and she and the leader then enter the force field protecting the colonists. This specific force field can only be entered by the colonists since it's DNA coded, so anyone else won't be able to enter. Salver then drives the leader to the vault, which knocks out the leader, and she then takes her to their investigation room for questioning. The leader sticks to her story of being a scrapper, but Salver figures out that the woman is the leader of the Anacreon. We also learn that more than half of the Anacreon citizens were killed by the Empires during the retaliation attack. In Terminus, the Anacreon soldiers were surrounding the protective field, and they set up a big machine that they think would penetrate the force field. The colonists, led by Salver, sets up their defenses, and in the interrogation room, the Anacreon leader, Farah, reveals that her planet is dying and that she needs the ship module so they can navigate space and find a new home. She tells Director Lewis that she has nothing to lose, while the colonists have everything to lose. She tells him to reconsider his position and give her the module, and at the end of the episode, we see Gale and her pod going through space, and it cuts to black when the pod reaches another ship. We then move on to episode 5, and the episode begins with showing us Gale's life before she left Synax. As a young girl, Gale worked for the Sears Church, and one night, she sails with her friend to an abandoned university, and she finds a man there taking books. She tells him to run away before anybody else sees him, but he takes out a math book and tells her to read it. Gale doesn't take the book, and the man is later arrested and executed. On his last words, he says that the rising sea level is because of their action, and not the anger of God. He is then drowned with his book, and that night Gale sneaks out and jumps inside the ocean, and she finds the dead body and the math book that he wanted her to read. Gale starts reading the book in hiding and starts to predict a flood coming, which people thought that she got from their god. As she falls in love with math, she knows that she doesn't have a future in Synax, and she enters the Imperial Math Competition and wins it. She then gets a message directly from Hari inviting her to work for him in the university, and news of Synax entering the competition has reached the people, but no one knew that it was her. She then comes clean to her parents, and her father was very unhappy, but on the final day he doesn't abandon her, he actually takes her to the ship and says goodbye. Back in the present, the pod that's been keeping her in cryostasis opens up when she enters the new ship, and she is immediately awakened and remembers Hari's death. The main door opens, recognizing Wright's blood from the knife, revealing to us that this is Wright's ship. 
Gail goes to the control room and asks the computer how long she was in status, and she's told that it's been 34 years. She then asks where she's going, but the computer tells her that she has no access, but she is able to see what's happening after Hari died. She sees Hari being sent to space after his death, and the colonists apparently blamed her as a co-killer of Hari, and she then watches Wright's execution. And before he died, he speaks directly to the camera, implying that this is directed for her and says, you can do this even with a piece missing. Gail cries as she sees Wright dying, and she even tries to off herself but decides against it on the last minute. Determined to know where she was going, Gail uses math to outsmart the computer into giving her the coordinates of their destination. But when she tries to see the place through the screen, it seems empty. She then decides to see for herself and wears a spacesuit and goes outside. And upon closer examination, she finds out that she's going to Hari's birth planet. Back at Terminus, an Imperial ship has come to assist the colonists. The commander talks to Lewis and orders him to get Farah to the main building so he can talk to her. Salver figures this was all her plan all along and runs back to the investigation room to stop them. But when she gets there, it was already too late. Farah, using a disruptor that she hid in her eye, shuts down the force barrier allowing her soldiers to attack, and Salver tries to stop Farah and she even manages to beat her, but her soldiers capture her mother, forcing her to surrender. Farah then forces her to watch as her colony gets destroyed, and they even take out the Imperial ship. Farah reveals that she blames the colonists because she believes Hari's prediction is what made the Emperors paranoid and made them attack their planet. When we go back to the ship, Gale runs back inside, and she doesn't want to go to Hari's planet because she knows the people believe that she killed him. As she contemplates what to do, she sees blood on the floor, and she follows the trail and finds a glitching projection of Harry, where he looks like he did the last time she saw him, and the episode just ends there. As we take a look at episode 6, the episode starts with Day and Demirzel traveling to meet the leaders of the religion Luminism. On their way, we learn that Demirzel also believes in the religion, but Day doesn't. Day doesn't believe because the empires are supposed to be bigger than anyone, and they've cheated death so they simply lack the need for religion. When they reach the planet, they're greeted by Ahamala, the woman that wants to change the tradition of the religion, and after exchanging pleasantries, Day feels like she's a worthy opponent. Later he meets with Gilat, the woman that's most likely to become the leader of the religion, and as a plus, she also supports him and his empire. Day raises his glass and announces his support for her, and promises to build the planet a desalination system so they won't be worried about drinking water anymore. Later at the funeral of the previous leader, Hamala gives a charismatic speech about how the greatest crime against the mother is stagnation and that humanity should always evolve, basically saying that genetic dynasties goes against their fate. Everyone was moved by her speech and they kneel, including Demirzel, and Day was the only one standing. Back in Trantor, Dusk invites Dawn for a hunt, and here we see Dawn doing amazingly and hunting six. This makes him an outlier since Dusk in his age only got three. It also seems like Dawn knows he's different, so he hides the extra three kills and tells Dusk that he only did three too. Later, Dawn turns down a prostitute that was sent by Dusk and meets in secret with Azura and he invites her to his bedroom and they watch a beautiful scenery outside and he reveals to her that he's colorblind, which is also something different from the ones that came before him. After knowing his secrets, Azura offers herself to be killed so Dawn can be sure that his secret won't go out, but instead, he kisses her. Back in Terminus, we see the Anacrian troops killing a lot of people, and Salver is captured and arrested so she can't help. But we see the kids from the first episode coming up with a plan to free her. Farah gathers all scientists within the colonists and tells them that she'll be needing speciality engineering so they can help her repair the skyship called Invictus. Just a little backstory, Invictus is a legendary warship that can destroy planets. And hearing all this, the scientists didn't want to cooperate at first, but they were forced as she threatens to kill their families. Next we see Salver as she's unconscious and she was tied up in the investigation room, and only one guard was watching her, and the kids were able to subdue him easily, and they then drag Salver out of the prison. And when she wakes up, they take her to her father and her boyfriend who escaped from the troops. She then comes up with a plan to take out the Anacrian ship so that they won't be able to leave and get to their bigger ship, but as Salva was trying to put her plan in action, she is hit with a vision and she falls to the ground. In her vision, she wakes up in Gale's clothes and she sees Hari and Reich talking the night he died. Hari tells Reich that he needs to kill him and gives him the knife, and Reich argues that he can fix it but Hari says, Everything collapses because you stay here with her, referring to Gale and that the entire galaxy is pivoting on the action of one person, who in this case is Reich. Reich gets convinced by whatever Hari was saying, and they hug, and he stabs him. 
Hugo then wakes Salver up and they've been spotted by the troops and they open fire at them and she starts fighting back but as they are getting surrounded, her dad runs in and grabs the explosives but before he can escape, he was shot. Salver starts taking out the troops that were attacking her father but as he lies on the floor, he detonates the bomb which takes out the troops and their ship, but he also, obviously, dies in the process. Salver vows to kill Farah and they return to the camp with Hugo, but they were quickly surrounded by Farah and her men. They are then taken to custody, and as the troops didn't have a ship, they take Hugo's ship, which could only be accessed by Salver now that he's changed the command to her. And episode 6 ends as they all get inside the ship and set course for their next destination. And on episode 7, it begins with Salver and the troops reaching the Invictus, which is a jump ship and not necessarily a war machine. Everyone puts their spacesuit on and jumps onto the ship, except for Hugo who couldn't perfectly land on the ship, and he floats over it into space. The others enter after disabling the ship's outer defense, and when they enter, they find the crew of the ship frozen and dead. With further investigation, they figure out that the ship malfunctioned and started jumping randomly which stranded the crew until they died. Lewis notes that they only have 4 hours before the next jump and Farah is counting on Salver being able to fix the ship, otherwise she was prepared to die as her sole purpose in life was to get revenge on Trancher by driving the ship into the heart of the planet and killing as many of them as possible. On the other side of the galaxy, we see Day angry at Demirzel and he questions her loyalty but she assures him that she's built to be loyal to him and that kneeling at the time was the right response tactically. They then plan their next step and Day decides to directly confront Hamela and directly asks her what she wants from him and she tells him that it's to end the genetic dynasty and she also tells him that she's not playing games and that she's only speaking the truth. Day then decides to go on the offensive and he calls to everyone and says that the mothers, goddesses, should decide who is right and what is true and what is not. He then announces that he will be going through the Great Spiral. And the Great Spiral is this impossible road to the core of the world where it's believed you can reach the Mothers. Back in Tranter, Dawn and Azura keep meeting in secret and he loses his V-card to her and he then takes her into the palace and takes her to the room where the replacement clones are made in case of an accident with the current ones or in his case if he's found out to be a defect, he would then get killed and replaced immediately. Azura then asks him to escape with her, and she tells him that she knows a place where they can change his identity. She then gives him this tech that enables him to see colors, and they keep communicating in secret as he strongly considers escaping. In the final storyline, we finally get back to Gale, and Hari stops glitching and explains that he wrote a protocol to save his mind in a computer, and he did indeed plan to off himself and make himself a martyr, as he believed that that would be stronger for the survivability of the Foundation, as dead people are remembered to be perfect. He further explained that he was supposed to off himself, and that Wright was supposed to escape to this ship after some time and then reunite, and Gale was not supposed to be here as she was supposed to lead the colonists and also lead the Foundation back in Terminus. Hari asks her where Reich is and she reveals to him that he was executed. She then asks him why Reich killed him and he reveals that it was because of his love for her and Hari changed his plan when he found out that Reich and Gale were in love so he made Reich kill him so he would be forced to leave the ship but this didn't really work out since Gale saw him and says he had to save her instead of saving himself. He put her in the pod where he should have been. Hearing all of this, Gale is pretty shocked and Hari is still confused as to how she found him as his son was, you know, killing him. Because during those hours, Gale usually spends her time at the pool. And Gale explains to him that she came and saw them there because she felt doom approaching. And around this point, Gale then starts remembering all the time that she felt something right before a bad thing happened. She then stops a micrometeor as it breaches the ship and almost hit her. And in that instant, Gale finally realizes that she can actually feel the future and the episode comes to an end. On episode 8, it starts with a flashback of Farah remembering the day that they were attacked by the Empire and she was playing outside with her brother before fire engulfed him. When we go back to the present, Salver is leading the group to the captain's quarters and they pass multiple defense mechanisms using her skill. They then finally reach the door to the captain's quarters and when it opens, Salver grabs a gun from the floor and shoots at Farah and her men and as they hide from her shot, she takes Lewis with her gun and gets inside the room before closing it again. Once there, they find the dead captain who offed herself and they then find the jumping operator frozen in his chair. Lewis explains that before spacers existed, and spacers are humanoid creatures that are not affected by a jump and they're potentially used to operate the ship during a jump. 
so back to his explanation. Before spacers existed, people were directly linked to the ship, which was super dangerous and could lead to death. With no other option, Salver asks him to link her to the machine as she plans to take the ship back to Terminus. But before he can hook her up, he's shot in the back and Farah has found a way to overload the door and has gotten in. They then both fire at each other, but suddenly outside forces attack the ship. Hugo, who was supposed to be dead, actually landed on a communication site and he's called thespians for help. And thespians are these guys that never say no to a kill because they enjoy killing. But before the thespians could land on the ship, the countdown reaches to zero and the ship jumps. When we go back to Gil and Hari, he still didn't tell her the full reason on why they are going to his home planet. Hari does reveal that a sister foundation will need to be built to ensure the completion of his plan, but refuses to elaborate more. But hearing all this, Gail is fed up with his antics and asks to leave if he's not going to tell her his plan. But Hari refuses to both requests, which leads to Gail taking down the cooling system of the ship, which raises the temperature rapidly and kill her soon. She then gives him an ultimatum, either let her die in front of him or let her go. Hari chooses to let her go and opens the door to her pod. She then sets her destination to Synax, which the computer tells her will take 138 years, and the pod puts her in cryostasis and begins the journey. Lastly, we follow Day on his journey on the Great Spiral. We'll have to walk barefoot 170 kilometers without food or water and without being allowed to stop on the scolding hot desert. Along the way, he meets a friend who helps him and guides him, but his friend couldn't make it to the end, as the journey became unbearable and his friend died. A day, with a bloody foot, reaches the mother's womb where he finds a pool of water. We later see him in front of vision tellers and he tells them that he saw a spiral flower appearing above him. And this has not been seen in over a thousand years and they interpret this as the mother accepting day, then they condemn Halima for opposing him, which makes Gilat, his preferred woman, to become the next leader. Later, Demirzil meets Halima in her chamber, and she reveals to her that she's an AI, which was rumored but not known for sure. Hamala figures she's telling her this because she came to kill her, and Demirzil starts crying and says sorry, as she doesn't want to do it but explains that she has no free will. Hamala then says that her compassion and belief is real and forgives her for what she's about to do, and Demirzil then poisons her and leaves. Later, Demirzil asks Day if the flower he saw in his vision was the same kind of flower that she had beside her desk. He denies it, but as he was preparing for a jump, we see a flashback of what really happened, and we see that Day was lying and didn't see anything, which visibly worries him, as this indicates that he has no soul. We then move on to episode 9, and the story is getting so enticing. The episode begins just after the jump, and Salver, the only one that's not affected, gets up, and is surprised to see that the ship has jumped to Terminus. She then calls for Lewis and finds him dead on the jumping operator chair, and Lewis was apparently the one that jumped him to Terminus, sacrificing his life in the process. Salver then lands on her ship and tries to communicate with Terminus Station, but there was no response. When she looks outside the ship, she realizes that she's brought some of the Thepsis ships with her, and she sends a message to them to get a response from Hugo. After Hugo landed on her ship and they embraced each other, she tells him that the vault's force field has expanded and has taken out all communications, and she's decided to go down there and stop it herself. Hugo doesn't want her risking her life, but she's determined, and she asks him to capture Farah and her men, who she left tied up on the jump ship. She also asks him to find a way to repair the ship so that they can use it. Back in Trantor, we see Dawn and Azur meeting in private, and he's decided to escape with her the next day. They even plan to give him a new name for his new life. He then meets with Dusk, who takes him through a tour of the Wall of Paintings, and they stop at the end, and Dusk shows Dawn a painting of their last hunt and the three kills that he has. Dusk then leaves for Dawn to admire the painting himself, and as soon as he leaves, Dawn takes out a tech that makes him see color, and he actually sees six kills in the painting. Dawn, realizing that he got caught, runs into his room and rushes to pack his bag. He is then interrupted by a guard that tells him Dusk is waiting for him, and as he was getting escorted, Dawn uses his Imperial Protective Device to knock out the guard and he runs away. Other guards are then sent to capture him, but he manages to escape through the water system, and he arrives in the city's underground and exchanges his protective device with a jacket. He then follows the route Azura told him and arrives at her house. Azura takes him to her bathroom so he can take a shower, but when he gets out, he finds an ambush orchestrated by Azura and he tries to escape but is captured by her men. 
When he wakes up, he finds himself tied to a chair, and his tracking device has been transferred to another clone of himself, and his clone explains that years ago, even before Dawn was born, resistance groups have taken Cleon's DNA and created their own Dawn, and they also altered Dawn's DNA, which they predict would make him run away, and they plan to exchange him for their own clone and destroy the Empire from the inside. Don starts crying as he couldn't believe Azura would do this to him, and when the transfer was complete, Azura thanks him for his cooperation, and when he asks her what will happen to him, she asks him what he thinks will happen to him, implying that they're going to kill him. But before they can do anything, the Imperial Guards break in and kill everyone except Azura and the original Dawn. Dusk arrives with them and reveals that he knew she was a spy, and let Dawn escape so he could lead him right to them. And after Azura was taken away, Dusk and Dawn are the only ones left inside the room. Dusk says that his stupidity is forgiven, but his differences are a reminder of their vulnerability, and that will not stand. But just for then, Dawn was safe, since Day will have the final decision on what to do. We then go back to Salver, who lands at Terminus, and finds everybody knocked out by the vault's force field. She finds her mom holding Hari's Prime Radiant, and when she holds it, she starts seeing a vision of both Hari and Gale opening it, and she uses that information and opens it in front of the vault. Then suddenly, a projection comes out of the Prime Radiant and opens the vault, which also makes everybody wake up. The Thespians land shortly after and try to apprehend the Anacreon soldiers, but then Farah comes with a stolen Thespian ship and blows up their ship, and she points her gun at Salver, but Salver pleads that all three groups can use the jump ship together, and she begs for the violence to stop, but then the vault starts glowing which scares Farah, and she starts shooting at it. Salver tells her to stop, but when she doesn't listen, she shoots an arrow in her neck and kills her. Everyone falls silent before Hari comes out of the vault, and says that seeing everybody gathered here gives him hope, and that they might actually have a chance of pulling this off. And after he said that, episode 9 comes to an end, when we move on to the very final episode, episode 10. The episode begins with Hari revealing that the centuries war between Anacreon and Thepsis was actually started by Cleon II, and he killed both their leaders and blamed each other for it. By doing this, he put two of the strongest planets in war and secured his power. Hari reveals that the Foundation is not an encyclopedia for the future, but a revolution to take down the Empire and start fresh. And for that to happen, both Anacreon and Thepsis need to work with each other to use the Invictus as a model and build multiple new ones so they can wage war against the Empire. A kid asks Hari how he's there, and Hari explains that he took a pill that contained millions of self-replicating nanomachines that broke his body down inside his coffin and recycled that material, transforming it into the vault. But over the decades, he wasn't able to awaken the whole time, and the force field was a defense mechanism, and he started waking up when the Anacreon came to attack. Hari then starts going back to the vault, but Salver stops him and asks him about the visions that she's been having, and Hari tells her that whatever visions she was seeing, they didn't really come from him. A couple months pass by, and the Anacreons and the Thespians are working together, and Hugo has become the captain of the ship, and Salver still hasn't figured out who sent her those visions. One day she wakes up in the middle of the night with the same feeling, she then goes to the vault and sees in a vision a young Gale jumping into water. Salver then goes to her mom Mari, and asks her who the water girl was, and Mari then reveals that Salver is the daughter of Gale and Reich, and she explains that the Foundation had a seed bank, and Mari chose to carry Gale and Reich's embryo once they reached Terminus. From this information, Salver learns that the visions must have been from Gale, and she decides to find her, and she hugs her mother goodbye, but just before she gets to her ship, Hugo appears behind her, and from his look, we see that he understands Salver needs to do this. They then kiss goodbye and Salver sets to the last known location of Gale. Back in Trantor, Day has arrived at the palace, and we see that his mannerisms has slightly changed since he went to the Great Spiral, and he visits Azura in prison, then takes her out for a walk and asks her what her legacy will be. He tells her that she took away the child that he raised from him, then lists off the numbers of family members, friends, co-workers, and anyone that's related to her, which comes down to 1,551 people, who are all under surveillance, and he then tells her that with the turn of his hand, all of them will be dead, and her legacy will be erased. He then turns his hand, confirming the death of all of the people that she had contact with, and for her punishment, he tells her that she will be in a room that gets no light, where she can't hear or taste anything, and so that she doesn't off herself she will be restrained, and she'll be fed only once in a while, as she'll be forced to live in total awareness of her agony. Later, Dawn is brought to the throne room by Demirzel. 
Dusk shouts at him and says that he would have killed him by now if he had the power. Then he turns to Day, who says that he had much time to reflect on their destiny during the Great Spiral, and he declares that it's time that the dynasty bent just a little and accept Dawn as he is. Dusk gets very angry and says that this is unacceptable. They then start arguing and Dusk even slaps Day. And during this, Dawn turns to Demirzel and begs her not to let them kill him. And she hugs him and tells him that she won't before snapping his neck and killing him herself. Day then takes Dawn to the Ascension Room, and he cries as he incinerates Dawn. Then a guard then enters the room and tells Day that the Rebels' plans to undermine the Empire was more extensive than they thought. They previously believed that the gene editing was only done on Dawn, but due to recent discovery, they found that the source DNA itself was also compromised. This means that the new copies will not be pure clones of Cleon. Day then gets very angry and smashes the glass care containing the original Cleon. We then see Demirzel in her room, and she opens her kit that she uses to fix her body, and she then throws it away and tears her whole face, and she screams and reveals her whole robot face. We are then taken to 138 years later, Gale has reached Synax and is awakened from her status, and she drops down to the planet and finds the land has been swallowed by the ocean. As she cries, she sees a red light coming from below, and when she swims down, she finds a status pod, which was holding Salver, and she opens the pod and takes out Salver, and Salver wakes up, Gale asks her why she's there, Salver then reveals that she was looking for her and tells her that she's her daughter. And the first season of Foundation ends here as Salver takes out the Prime Radiant and offers it to Gale. It was a really great season, to be honest it was one of the greatest shows I've seen in a while. If you guys want me to do season 2 which is coming out now, please leave me a comment. Also, like my video, subscribe to my channel, I love you guys so much and I promise to see you on my next recap. Bye!